everyone, and welcome to the Frontiers of Parameterized Complexity. Before we start with the scientific part, uh, just a small announcement. We go for a summer break, so there will be no talks the whole July, and we will, but we will have some surprises for you in August. So please stay tuned. And it's a great pleasure to welcome our next speaker, Marcin Pilipchuk, who will be speaking about optimal discretization, which is fixed parameter tractable. Please, Marcin. Thank you very much. I hope you hear me well. So, uh, yes, so I'm going to tell you about this puzzle of optimal discretization. I will call this problem red blue points, as we'll see in a moment. That's optimal discretization is just a fancy name. I would just call it red blue points. And this is really like, I would need, want to start that this is really like a very enjoyable puzzle in my head. I mean, it was really a pure fixed parameter trackability problem without any theory around it, without any like deeper things around it. It was just a combinatorial puzzle to understand the, the structure of the problem, and I enjoyed it a lot. So, yeah, so that's what's joint work with our people from Warsaw, and that was at that moment in Warsaw, and Stefan Kratz. Uh, but, yeah, so this, this work really reminded me of time of my own PhD when I was young and I was doing my PhD when I was really focusing on some combinatorial puzzles, not really thinking about any big picture or any, like, wider application of what I'm doing here, and that allowed me to immerse into this family, into this very family family world of parameterized complexity and this family atmosphere we have here, here. So I would like to start with actually thanking my collaborator, my main collaborator, not in this paper, in other papers, Michał, who actually has a birthday today. So I would like to first say happy birthday, Michał, and it was a great pleasure to work with you, and uh, thanks, and I would like to take this opportunity to have a round of applause to Michał, who has got his birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. That's very <laughs> kind of you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so let's proceed to the scientific part now, once we are done with the most, most important parts. So I'm going to work on red, I'm going to work with red blue points here. And uh, yeah, so this is like problem called official optimal discretization. I will tell you shortly why this is really, uh, why it's called like that, but the true name or the most intuitive name is red blue points. We'll see in a moment why. But first I would like to present here my co-authors. Uh, we were working in Warsaw, Tomasz, Irene, and Manuel were here, and we were working on the paper. Some of them managed to escape, Manuel is still trying to escape from Warsaw, and Stefan is in Berlin all the time there. Okay, so that's our main results. So I'm going to tell you about one puzzle, about one algorithm for one specific very cute problem, how to solve it in fixed parameter track of time, and the problem. Okay, so here we go for red blue points. We have got a plane, and there are two sets of uh, and there are two sets of points there. There's red points and blue points. These sets are disjoint. It doesn't make sense if there's a point that's both red and blue. And there's some teacher K. And the goal is to draw horizontal and vertical li lines. The K is the budget. We can draw K lines together, K horizontal or K vertical lines in total. And you want to separate the, you want to really to separate the points from each other. So there's like, there, you want in every this cell. So you have got the cells like that. So yeah, you can. You think of this as a cell, and inside every such cell, you want to have got point only in one color, or maybe some cells will be empty, like this cell is an empty cell. Yeah? So we want to separate red points from blue points by drawing K horizontal or vertical lines. That's the problem. That's the puzzle we're going to solve. And obviously, it's very easy to develop an algorithm running with time roughly n to the K, because there are roughly n reasonable places to place the lines, and you can try all possibilities. But the goal is to prove to get a fixed parameter algorithm parameterized by k. Okay, why do we care? Well, if you look at this problem, if you look at it from the sort of machine learning motivation, this is present in Vincent Fuse's PhD thesis, is that you have got points on the plane and these points come from two different sets. Yeah, there's the red set and the blue set, so like through, dif through different like populations. And they have got these two coordinates, uh, so they're on the plane. And you want to round the coordinates. So you want to like discretize the coordinates. That's the name, that's where this name discretization comes from. You want to round the coordinates so that you will have got as few coordinates in total as possible, as few different values for coordinates as possible, but you never collapse a blue point and a red point on this, uh, onto the same place. Yeah. So what does it mean in this picture is that hey, you say that there are like actually four different coordinates for the uh, four different y coordinates and I believe nine, yeah, nine different coordinates for the uh, x coordinate and you collapse, like you round up to the 
correct coordinate every every vertex, every point in the, every point in the plane, and you never merge a blue point and a red point into one point by this by this process. Yeah, so all these guys become one big point, one red point. All these guys become one big blue point, but you never merge two guys of different colors. So that's why the name optimal discretization rate comes from. And this is really like sort of like ML motivation for this research or for this for this problem. Actually, in ML, there's a different problem also studied uh, that when that you're adding these lines by one by one by one and making a decision tree, and you want in the end to have minimum number of nodes of your tree and separate red points from blue points. That's a bit different problem. It has a different complexity. Here we focus on this particular problem mostly because I mean, from my point of view, mostly because it has got a very nice combinatorics and it's a very tricky problem. This problem was studied, so let's go over there. This problem was studied uh, on IPEC uh, 17 by a group of authors here. And they showed that this problem, if you are not restricted to drawing horizontal and vertical lines, so if you draw, can draw uh, rows at uh, lines at different angles, know that this completely departs from this ML motivation. I mean, now it's not rounding coordinates, just separating by lines. Then the problem becomes double and hard, confirmed twice by K. But they showed that problem with lines horizontal and vertical is FPT if you parameterize by the smaller set of the points. So if there, are, if there are a few blue points and a lot of red points, then fending off these blue points away is fixed much rapidly in the number of blue points. Yeah, so that's like the result. And they especially ask the question, what about parameterization by K? Yeah, what's about parameterization by K? Because that's the most natural parameter here. Yeah, that's the like solution size parameter. That's the thing that we all have been studied since decades. Okay, so that's the question. And yeah, another motivation, more, more theoretical, comes from a very similar problem as you will see in a moment, namely rectangle stabbing. There's the problem that you have got, again, a plane, but instead of points, now you have got a bunch of rectangles and their axis parallel, like on this picture, and you want to draw a number of lines, again, horizontal or vertical lines, and you want to intersect every rectangle. You want to stab every rectangle. So on this picture, I believe this is a solution of size three to this picture. And it's actually quite tricky, I think. It took me a while to, uh, to draw this picture. And in this picture, well, um, yeah, and, but actually this problem turns out to be double and hard. There's quite a trivial reduction, a decade old reduction from, I mean, it appeared in the journal in 2012, but it's a bit earlier. So this problem is actually double and hard, but it's actually quite non trivial task to prove this double and hard. You can try it on your own. You can, you need to work for a while, some good gadgets there to get double and hard risk here. Okay. So why I'm talking about this one? I mean, there's K, there's plane, okay, that's fine. They're drawing lines, that's fine. But is there any closer connection to red blue points? Well, actually there is. If you have got your instance of red blue points, you can think of actually separating two guys. So if you look at this guy, like look, this guy and this guy, like separating these two guys is really exactly the same as stabbing this rectangle. Yeah, so if you take a red point and a blue point and draw a gray rectangle, like with the corners, with the opposite corners being these two points, then separating these two guys is exactly stabbing this rectangle. Because to separate these two guys, you need to either draw some line somewhere here or draw some line somewhere here. Okay, so you can reduce red blue points to rectangle stabbing by drawing for every red point and for every blue point a rectangle around them and ask to stab all these rectangles. There's a second rectangle for this guy and for this guy there. But in the reduction, you need to draw for every pair. So you get this beautiful and clearly, very clear and concise picture up here. And now you draw your solution and it's clearly visible on this picture that all the gray rectangles are stopped. And this is really the solution for the red blue points. Okay. So we have proven here that uh, red blue points is not harder than rectangle stabbing. Rectangle stabbing is harder, but this doesn't really prove anything. Yeah. I mean, we have got a problem red blue points that we don't know fixed parent interactability, and you have reduced it to a W1 hard problem. So we haven't proved anything. We only proved, we only gave some motivation for the problem. Yeah, we said, okay, this red blue points problem, it's not harder than rectangle stabbing, but maybe it's actually FPT. So maybe it's actually, so maybe it's actually like the limit of our tractability. So if you make slightly more general, having rectangle stabbing, try to phrase rectangle stabbing as red blue points. I don't think it's possible. I mean, it's not possible because we proved red blue points is FPT, but these rectangles here are quite specific. I mean, there are a lot of them, but they have got quite specific structure. So it's tempting to say, hey, red blue points is interesting because it's a non-trivial problem that may be actually tractable. Why rectangle stabbing, a slightly more general problem, is actually double one hard. And here's the limit of tractability. So yeah. So our result is that really, uh, our result is that really this problem, red blue points, I will call it red blue points till the end of the talk, but 
more formal or like more fancy name is optimal discretization for the ML uh, uh, machine learning uh, motivation I told you before. And it's a bit tight. And the running time bound, like the point right, we don't analyze the polynomial. I don't want to say about polynomial and we don't really analyze in the paper. It's, it's far from linear and I don't want to speak about it. Uh, the, expon the exponential part is k to the k square. And I will try to convince you that this is quite a natural, um, that is actually quite a natural um, complexity for this problem. Okay, that actually k to the k square is something that's natural here. The branching steps here tend to have this time complexity. So I think this is a challenging problem to improve it better than c to the k. I mean, maybe log can be removed, but get, getting below this k square seems challenging and requires a change of, a change of paradigm, I think. Okay. So that's the setting. And the plan for my talk is to really now dive into the details of the problem and show you the beautiful combinatorics of this problem. It was very addictive for me and like depart from the theory part. So this is really like a talk about like tricky combinatorics problem and there's not much more theory than what I saw, told you today. Is there, are there any questions among you for the statement of the problems or for like big picture around it? I don't see anything on the chat. I'm looking at the chat. So okay. I have uh, a little so, question. Yes. Yes. Uh, about about this this problem where the lines don't necessarily have to be axis parallel. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's W one hard as you said, but if we wanted to approximate it slightly, is is anything known about it? I don't know. Maybe we have among the audience some of the authors of the IPEC paper and have that have got more opinion. I don't really know. I don't know the answer to this question. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. So we try to solve this problem and we have got this difficult problem. So what do we do? Well, you can take your favorite book in favorite book for parentized complexity, open it on a random page, and this random page you find the technique, iterative compression. Here it is iterative compression. So let's try iterative compression. Okay, so under iterative compression, well, how, how does it work? Yeah, iterative compression, you usually use it for the graph problems when the vertices or something arrive one by one and you try to expand your solution adding vertex one by one. What does it mean here? Well, the points arrive by one by one. Hey, if you see there's a new point arriving here, there's a new point. Uh, oh, so Edward said that the reduction from the paper doesn't throw out and fixed parameter approximation scheme. So maybe it's possible. Okay, uh, so a new guy arrived and now, well, now you have got your almost solution, yeah? There's the solution you have, a new guy arrived and there's this one cell here that's broken, okay? Well, you can fix it by just say, adding four new guys. Yeah, I did just ask four new guys. They're like private fans for this guy, that's fine. But I paid for too much, yeah? I paid for too much. And that's the gist of the iterative compression. Yeah, you, by arriving guys one by one, you can quite trivially get a solution that's slightly too big, and then you want to compress it. And th but the solution that's slightly too big gives you some structure about how this, this instance look like, and give you some structure on which you can work. Yeah. So here, what that would really say is that by paying an extra n in the running time factor, which we don't really care at the moment, you can have access to a solution of size k plus four. So if you do it. If you just make it more, I mean, if you just, okay, so what I would say is that you can really solve the compression problem when you have got the solution of some size and you want to find, check if there's a solution of smaller size and the size of the solution you have at hand is your parameter, yeah? And now if I apply it four times to a solution of size k plus four with parameter k plus four, k plus three, or the output of the previous iteration, then I can actually check if the solution of size k plus four can be compressed to a size k, okay? So the problem I'm really solving by applying iterative compression is really that I had given some solution of some size. The size I'm given is the parameter. And now I want to check if there's a smaller solution or if it's, uh, this one is actually the minimum, okay? So in our compression problem, I, want, I, ha I, have, I have an instance of red points and I have a solution and I want to check if there's a smaller one. I did this off by one offset by saying that the instance that comes is of size k and the one I want to find is of size smaller than k. Usually when you phrase iterative compression in book, the one you have is k plus one and the one you want to find is k, but it doesn't really matter of course because I mean it's k or k plus one, it doesn't matter for all of, all of k square log k in the exponent in our running time bound. 
Okay, so that's the problem we are going to solve. We applied theory of compression. The book is already used. Now we need to think on our own. Okay, so let's go there. And in this picture, I may maybe for some of you that was quite surprising that actually in this picture you can make a compression. It's actually a compression by three. So the green lines, the green dashed lines, is a solution that's three lines smaller. And that's like more or less the solution we are looking for. Okay, there's a gap of three in this example, but there's actually quite not trivial. And I don't know how many of you really suspected that you can save here. I mean, the green solution is actually quite different than the black solution up here. And actually it's quite non-trivial. It's quite non-trivial for me was to actually see on this picture uh, like the, the new solution that actually you can save here a lot by drawing a lot of green lines here but actually saving somewhere in between. That was actually quite surprising for me. So let's, so this picture will go with us for most of the talk, this actual example. And okay, so let's try. So we have got this picture and we know the black solution. We know the points, but we don't know the green solution. We want to look for the green solution. So of course the not next technique, if you, we can also open the book. The next technique apart from iterative compression is branching. And this is like the natural way of what can you guess having only like f of cake choices, what can you guess about this picture, about the solution that may help you find it, okay? So you have to this picture. I haven't drawn the points yet. I just drawn the grid up there. You can guess how many green lines, oh, so you don't know the green lines, but you can guess what's the overlay of the black and green lines, yeah? You can guess that actually, okay, you have got the black lines, but actually there's one green line here, one green line here, and three green lines here. There's one green line here and two green lines here, yeah? And up there, there are no other green lines anywhere else. Yeah, that's the solution you're looking for actually overlays over the solution you have at hand, but it's slightly too large in this manner. That's the first branching step you can guess. There's something like K to the K guessing or something like that. It's cheap. Okay, so we guessed this information, but you can guess also something more. Yeah, so we have got this overlay. You can draw this overlay. You can draw this green lines, not exactly at the precise position, but you can just draw them without looking at the points and just say, okay, that's how I want the picture to look like. Like this is the overlay of the green and black, black, black stuff. But also you can guess what's inside every cell. So now you can think of this picture. So actually the black guys were solutions. Yes, yeah? so every like black area is monochromatic, has got guys from only one color. All the green areas, now I, now all the green areas like this area should have guys only from one color. Okay, but if you look at the union of the two solutions, there are actually some smaller areas. Yeah, there are the smaller areas. Let me use blue for the uh, blue is the wrong color. Let, let me use gray for them. There are the small areas here. And actually what you can guess, and the number of these areas roughly k square. Yeah, the number of these areas roughly k square. So what you can do, you can guess for every of these areas, you can actually guess whether it's empty or whether it contains some of the points. Okay, so this is actually the, present like the projection of the actual solution up there. If you look at the solution that was few sizes before, then you have got this template or this pattern, uh, let's call it pattern, that actually like in this cell, we expect some red point, in this cell, we expect some blue point, and in this cell, we expect no points, okay? And this is the pattern. And now the question now becomes, can we draw the green lines so that they really, I like that. So there are actually three guys, three lines here, one line here, two lines here, etc. And actually all the small cells are as we guessed. So they're either empty or there are blue lines or only blue points there or there are only red points there. This guessing is not like we don't really, if you look into the details of the algorithm, you don't really need to care about exactly if I find these guesses. Like for example, this guy, it wouldn't hurt us if this guy actually have blue points inside there. But let's think of actually we have got this overlay picture and we want to position the green line so that the picture looks exactly like, like on this pattern we guessed. Yeah, so that this cell actually has got no points, it actually has got some blue points, etc. Okay, or can only have blue points. Let's, let's have it this way. Okay, so that's the pattern we have guessed. And now once you, once, if you think about this is like guessing this colors is something like three to the K square. Yeah, it's something like three to K square or order of K square because there's order of K square cells here, the small cells, I will call the small guys now cells. Small guys are now cells, they're roughly K square cells and there are three options for every cell. There are actually much less options for every cell, there are actually two options, because, but that doesn't matter, but 
there's constant number of options for every cell. And that's really like, that's the primary reason why there's k-squared in the exponent, yeah? I don't think like this guessing step is easy to avoid. And in this guessing step, you have got this k-squared to exponent. So that's like the first reason we have k-squared in the exponent. And through, the, through this lecture, there will be like a lot of reasons for to have k-squared in the exponent. Okay, good. So that's the guessing step. I hope it's quite clear. Now, I want to, now there's like a very important paradigm shift or a very important change of way of thinking that helped us a lot thinking about this problem. Is that I want to think is to, about it as a constraint satisfaction program, yeah? So what I want to say, I want to say that actually, like I have got here, I have guessed that here there's one green line, okay? There's green, one green line here. So let me change the color to green. There's one green line here, okay? That I have guessed before, yeah? Uh, but I know don't, don't know the position. My task is to get to understand the position, to like uh, reason about the position of this line. Okay, so I want to think about it as a as a variable. Yeah, so this line here is x1. This is a variable x1 whose domain is like all the possible positions of lines here. This is the domain of x1. Okay, and you can think of this domain as actually being this interval. You can discretize it because there's you can easily convince yourself that there are like only like at most n reasonable places to put this line. So there are like the domains of size at most n if you want to make discrete. You can think of it as being continuous interval. It doesn't really matter at this moment. Yeah. So you have got this, this uh, you have got this in variable here that has got the domain here. You have got this variable that has got this domain here. You have got this three variables that has domain here. It's one of this line up there. And you have got this three variables here with the corresponding domains. This is the domain of y1 one, 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 one and y2. And this is the domain of y3. Yeah, so every line, green line that we don't know where to place becomes now a variable with the domain being all the possible positions where we place it, okay? And now our goal is to phrase it as a constraint satisfaction problem. So we have got this with these variables. There are k variables. So in the world where there are few variables, there are only k variables. So the number of variables are a parameter or like less than k param var variables, but uh, the domain is huge, yeah? The domain is like, roughly n, uh, the n reasonable places to put a line at most n, okay? So that's like our world. So we have got few variables with huge domains. And now we, what we want to do, we want to introduce constraints between this domain, between these variables. We want to introduce the constraints that say, hey, actually uh, like, okay, there are only red guys allowed here. No guys are allowed here. There are only red guys allowed here, etc. okay? So you want to say, so you have got these variables. Now we want to introduce constraints between these variables saying what we guessed in the pattern. Yeah, that's our goal. And the other thing we want to introduce is the, the ordering thing. Yeah, okay, x1 will be here, x2 will be x will be here, but I want to introduce the constraint x, x3 is smaller than x4 so that the line x3 is before the line x4. I want to introduce the constraint x4 is smaller than x5, and I want to introduce the constraint y1 is smaller than one, y2. Okay, so I want really to introduce these constraints just because, uh, yeah, I want this line to behave in the correct order. That would be easier for reason. Okay, so there will be constraints, this ordering constraints that are actually quite easy to phrase, like this earlier line is before the larger line, but also there will be like constraints saying that corresponding cells are as we guessed. Okay, as we guess there are in the pattern. That's our goal. Yep, and now this other constraints, now the picture disappears, but now, now the, uh, the other constraints are, is that what we really want to say is that we want to say that the, these guys that are guessed red, they cannot contain blue points, or, and the empty guys cannot contain blue points, and the empty guys and the red blue guys cannot contain red points, yeah? So we want to constraint say that there's no red point inside a cell that didn't guess red, and there's no blue point inside a cell that didn't guess blue. Okay, that's our constraints. And they seem very vague at the moment for you probably. Yeah, they seem very vague for you at the moment. So let's try to understand them further. Okay, let's try to understand them further. So this is a recap because we don't have space for picture and the whole demonstration at once. But yeah, we have got the green lines become variables. The domain is the place between the black lines we guessed. We have got the ordering constraints saying that the every line before the later line, that's, uh, that's the simple one, but we want to have the constraints now I specified as follows. Yeah, for every red point and for every cell that guessed itself not to be red, yeah, so empty or blue, 
we have a constraint saying, hey, this point didn't, doesn't line in this cell, okay? Uh, that's still a vague constraint, but at least it specifies one cell and one point. So we do a, a, a we introduce a constraint for every point and for every cell that cannot accommodate this point. And the same here, like for every blue point and for every cell that cannot accommodate this blue point, we introduce constraint. Let's try to understand these constraints. Okay, let's try to understand these constraints. Well, uh, this constraints will be equivalent to like checking the overlay we guessed before. So this constraint will be equivalent because we are checking everything. It's like easy to verify. I mean, it's a tedious check, but it's easy to verify that actually we didn't lose any information. We're just checking if this pattern and overlay we guessed is actually reasonable and we phrase it as a constraint resurrection program. But let's look at an example of a constraint. Let's look at a cell. So there's an example of a cell here below that has actually have got three green lines and one black around it. Okay. So what does it really mean? There is this blue point here. There's some blue point here that we guess. This is this point P, okay? There's, there's some blue point that we takes into account, like we are doing like for this cell C and for this point P, a constraint. And this constraint says that this point cannot land in this cell, okay? And what we see at the beginning, we see this black line and we see this point, yeah? So this point lies here. So how this guy not happen not to land in the cell? How does this may happen? This point is fixed, but the lines are variables, yeah? So either what happens, is either actually this line lines here, yeah? So we have got xi smaller than the coordinate or x coordinate of this point, or this line actually lands above. So this is yi, yj being above this line, having y coordinate higher than yp, than the coordinate of point, or actually this line landing below, and you have got yij plus one smaller than yp. Okay, so this is like a temporary constraint here, binding the three lines, bond, bounding this. Like, so this is like a constraint saying that, uh, the, so, the la, the, the, so the point P is not in C, it's actually constraint, oh, sorry for that. It's actually constraint binding the three lines or the, all the green lines bounding the cell C. It's a constraint binding all the lines bounding the cell C saying that actually the picture is not like that. Yeah, they actually something, uh, one of the green lines actually on the opposite side of the point P as on, the, on this picture. Okay, so that's like how this constraints look like. Yeah, so in general, this is the constraint saying like one of the lines bounding the cell C is on the other side of the point P than you would expect it, uh, than it ha that it happens when the point P is inside the cell. Let's go over all the five cases, how many green lines, uh, how many green lines uh, are boundaries, how many boundaries of the cell C are green lines. Yeah, so now we're looking at a fixed point and the fixed cell that guess that this point cannot land in the cell. And now we look, how does this constraint look like? This is an example with three guys, but let's look over all of them and see how, which are complicated because this one looks complicated. This is a ternary constraint. Ternary constraints are very scary, okay? So let's go over them. So first, there may be a cell which is completely black lines. Yeah, there's completely black lines up there. And uh, well, there's no, nothing we can do. Yeah? This is a fixed cell. There will be no green lines drawn here up there. So actually, like either you have guessed that this cell accommodates blue points or not, and you cannot change it by taking the values of the green lines. Yeah? So either your overlay and pattern guess was wrong if this point cannot land in the cell, or it was correct and this point can land here and everything is okay. So this is really a non-existent case. This is trivial. Yeah, th there's nothing to be done here. Like this is a cell that we don't need to work about. We don't need to care about. But there is a case, now let's look at the case when the actual cell has got one green line. This is a legitimate case. The first case was a bogus case. The first case is a legitimate case. So there's a cell like that, that looks like that. You guess that it does cannot contain blue points. It's empty or red but there's a, this blue point and you want to say constraint that actually the picture doesn't look like that. That this blue point cannot, uh, that this point cannot be inside the cell. And this actually means that this green line needs to be to the left here. Yeah, and then this cell is here. Okay, that's the only thing that can, that's the only thing that can save you. So the constraint is really, the line is to the left of this point. Of course, this can be like flipped and symmetric in all the directions, but on this picture, that means that this line is to the left of this point, which is this unary constraint, just a unary constraint binding xi. 
and you can either introduce this constraint, but it's easier to think of them like actually you kick out from the domain of xi all the values that don't satisfy it. Yeah? If you have a unary constraint, you can take the value up there, the variable up there, and just kick out from the domain the guys that don't satisfy this, that don't satisfy this constraint. Okay? So these guys are easy. Yeah, we just look at this, we get if there is like there are some values for xi that put the point in the wrong place, we just kick them out from the domain. We don't allow them in the domain. That's easy. Then there's the case of two green lines. It's actually two not exactly symmetric cases when there's an X and a Y, or there's like two Y's or two X's, like two parallel green lines or two perpendicular green lines, but they're actually quite symmetric there. Yeah? So they're actually quite symmetric from the point of the CSP language because they really say that if this point is not allowed to land in the cell, it actually means that this line is below here or this line is above here, okay? And here it means that either this point is this line is to the left here or this this line is above this here. Yeah. And this is exactly the same way of reasoning we have said before. Yeah. This is like just the statement saying that okay, this line is higher or this line is lower. And yeah, so you have got this constraints that are now binary constraints, which is like of the form, okay, one variable is larger than some constant, or another variable is smaller than some constant. And there's here's the same type of the same type of uh, the same type of uh, picture. Note that the smaller and larger can be the other way around. If you, for example, have got the picture when there's like, um, let me draw the picture. If there's an example looking in like this, uh, then you will have got two inequalities in the same direction. But it doesn't matter. So this constraint will be really of the form. This constraint will be from some x is smaller or larger than some value, or some other guy is smaller or larger than some other value. Yeah, this constraint will look like that. Okay, if I take into account two green lines. Okay, now the guys with three green lines we have seen, the guys with three green lines we have seen, I have wrote how it does, it's exactly the same as before, but now you take into account three variables. Yeah, so it's really like how this, this, po this cell can avoid this point, it can avoid in three different ways, either by putting x to the left or putting the yj plus one below or putting yj above. Okay, so there are like three ways of avoiding it, and this constraint is really an or of these three ways of avoiding this uh, of avoiding this point inside the cell. Okay, and there is the um, and there is the fourth line, and the fourth I want to say that the fourth one is bogus again. Okay, so I have got this four guy for this cell, with, which is like surrounded by four green lines. Okay, and this seems like scary. If you look before, hey, and now I want to write a four array constraints with four variables saying that there are four ways of actually avoiding this point. But there's a very tricky observation saying that we actually don't care. Yeah, that actually now we are going to use the fact that the black lines were was the solution because there, this green cell actually lives inside one of the black cells. I mean, the black solution makes the cell larger and it was still monochromatic. So if you have got this picture that you have got black lines and you are supposed to draw green lines inside, a few green lines like, like that, then whatever you do, you will never make this cell not monochromatic because the entire black cell was monochromatic, okay? It has guys only of one color, okay? So in this picture, okay, maybe our pattern gets something stupid here, but we don't really care. I mean, these cells, these green cells, the cells of the green solution, they will be always okay because they're inside the black cell and we allow only the green lines to go around between the black lines. Those are these domains. So this will be always okay. So we can ignore the constraint for cells that have got four green lines around it. Okay, so we have got this, so we have got this case two and case three lines, the case, case two and case three constraints. For case one, we have said that we can kill some guys from the domain because that's a unary constraint. A case zero is non-existent, a case four can be ignored. Okay, so we have made our, we have understood our CSP. Now our CSP stopped to be vague, yeah? What we do, we have got this XIs and the YJs with the do corresponding domains, and there are binary and ternary constraint corresponding to like point not landing in some cell, and the cell, if I've got two green lines, it is binary constraint, and if the cell has got three green lines, it's, it's a ternary constraint. So you may ask, okay, we phrased it as a CSP question, how difficult the CSP language is? Because now we didn't make an equivalence relation, yeah? We said, okay, let's think of a CSP language. So let's think of a instance of a, like, so that there are variables. These variables have 
uh, ordered domains. These are the coordinates for the, the subsets of reals or subsets of integers out there. And you can have got like binary or ternary constraints of this form. Yeah. So that, okay, the constraint is an alternative of like some, some variable is smaller than some value or some variable is smaller than some value. And remember that there are also constraints like xi smaller than xi plus one. There are also these constraints. They're quite similar to this one. So they're slightly different, but they're quite similar to the case to constraints actually. Indeed. So this is really, uh, uh, yeah, so this is really what we get. We get the CSP and now you can ask how complicated or how difficult this problem is or how hard this problem is in terms of complexity. So unfortunately it's quite hard, but there's one good news. Uh, yeah, so this is the statement. Sorry, I forgot I have got the summary slide here. This is actually what we get. Yeah, we have got our cons our our vari variables, xi and yj's, and we have got the monotony constraints saying that the guys with lower index are earlier. And for every point should the, for every point in the two cell, where the point shouldn't land in this cell, you have got this type of constraint. And for every point in the cell that has got three green lines and the point shouldn't land in this cell, you have got this type of constraint. Okay, and of course here, like, I mean, I broke the symmetry by drawing the greens line like that, but you can imagine like the, all the symmetric options for like different lines being green and black in these pictures. Okay, so that's the CSP phrasing we have. And unfortunately, this is something that doesn't work, yeah? So we have lost a lot of information about the structure of the problem by just saying, hey, let's look at the CSP language with like this type of constraints and like small number of variables, but with large domains. Okay, and unfortunately this problem is now hard because of this free ternary constraint. Yeah, that's, so that's why, I mean, intuitively when you have ternary constraints, the situation starts to be quite difficult. Ternary constraints are quite difficult. And in this picture, they're really like the reason for the difficulty here. Yeah, because the very important special case, the things that somehow like, is, can you can quite quickly observe in this problem, but something that's, really like uh, triggers the research is that if k3 doesn't happen and k3 happen only if there's a picture with like if there's like some black cell and a lot of green cells crossing it so if there's a lot of green cells crossing it there's at least one horizontal one crossing it then you have got a lot of cells of size type, type 3 here around okay and a lot of cells of type 3 here around okay then the, actually the problem is polynomial time solvable you have got the domain out there, you have the constraints, you have got this type of constraints. And this theorem, this CSP is actually polynomial time solvable. So if you have got only binary constraints and your constraints are of the type, something is smaller than the other guys, or if you have got this type of constraints, yeah, something is smaller than a constant or some, uh, some other variable is larger than a constant or smaller than a constant or something like that. If you have got this one, this is polynomial time solvable. And the reason why it's polynomial time solvable, the reason for the CSP gigs is that the median, the median function is the majority polymorphism here, but the proof for the normal people is that if you think for it for a while, you can get a reduction to, to satisfy a bit of the CNF sat formula. Yeah, so it's really like this problem is polynomial time, sol time solvable just because you can phrase it as two CNF sat, or you can think of like, if you have got three different solutions, then taking a me coordinate wise median, it's also a solution to every constraint out there. And this is the reason why this uh, solvable and like there's like a well understood methodology, how the algorithms for this type of CSPs look like because they have got a majority polymorphism. But the problem is that if you allow now constraints that have got three that are ternary like that, uh, that we have got in case three, then the median stops to be majority polymorphic. You can easily develop, a, um, you can easily develop a, a counterexample. And what do we do now? Because the problem, if you look into it, the problem becomes much harder. The satisfiability of the problem when you allow ternary constraints is much harder. So this is not the way. We need to now extract more from the red blue points problem to restrict our CSP instance to like understood more structure of the CSP instance to be able to solve it, okay? So what do we do now, okay? What do we do now? This is the picture when the case free is important. In this picture, we really care about this area being empty. This area cannot have any blue points because it's inside the black cell that's red, it's inside the black cell that's red, so there are no blue points here, but we really care about this one being empty because in the green solution, there will be like a cell like that and there, are, there may be actually some blue points coming from here. Okay, so the case three is really important. We really want to care about some of this K3 
case free cells to be really empty because on, in the green solution they can be merged with some blue areas up there from the different neighboring black cells. Okay, so that's like an illustrative picture. And now uh, let me go for this example. This is a good example of the case free, which I want to sell you the intuition why this is, has got much stronger structure. In that, that why this picture has got like a much stronger structure that we understood so far. Okay, what's the structure here? So this is the picture when actually this green line is a solution. And this is the picture when there's like a few black cells next to each other. Okay, and there are only two green lines vertical, but there are a lot of horizontal ones. Okay. And if you look at this picture, in this picture you can see a pattern. So if you look at the, this pattern, so now I drop to the pattern you guessed, you guessed this pattern before. And this pattern really says that if you look at these two green lines here, okay, then there is like a blue cell here. There's a blue cell here. There are two red cells here. There's again a blue cell. There's a red cell, there's a blue cell, and there's a red cell. Yeah, so the the, like the pattern here, if you go from top to bottom, the pattern of the blue of the green solution is really a blue cell, a red cell, a red cell, a blue cell, a red cell, a blue cell, a red cell, and a red cell. Okay, so it's really like between these two x1 and x2. This really this pattern. So there's some alternation here. There's like a blue guy, red guy, a blue guy, a red guy, a blue guy, and a red guy. So there's like some alternation here between the red and blue guys. And if this alternation starts to be higher than like two or something like this, if this really alternation really happens, this picture starts to be quite complicated. But what I want to say now, the observation I want to make now is that, well, let's fix the value of x1. Let's say that somebody came and said us, Marcin, in the correct solution, you put x1 here, and we draw this x line, x1. This x1 is drawn here. Okay, this x1 is drawn here. Okay, it's solid, it's fixed. Okay, now in this observation, we know that x2 somewhere varies here, and this y somewhere varies here. Okay, but let's look at this area. So let's make a grip n, and let's, our area of interest is this area, yeah, between here and between here. This is our area of interest. Okay. In this area of interest, we know all the red points. In this area of interest, we know all the red points. Yeah, X2 can vary, X2 can change left to right, but it will only include more blue points or more red points on this picture. I'm just saying about this picture, I'm, I'm not saying this is a super general picture, but on this picture, varying X2 only mm, changes the amount of blue points inside, inside this area of interest. It doesn't change the, the, the amount of red points, okay? And now, so let's look, let's look that we somehow like go there and we know from our pattern that there will be like y7, y5, y4, y3, and y3. This will be like this five lines that separate blue from red. From the guessing of the pattern, we know that there's a blue, red, blue, red, blue, red, red with this five div division lines. So we should see here, if we scan this picture from top to bottom, if we scan this picture from top to bottom, we should see an alternation of like some blue points, some red points, some blue points, some red points. And this alternation, we know how it is. It's, we can infer it from the pattern. On this picture, it should be six. Yeah, there should be like three blocks of blue and three blocks of red up there. Okay. And what I'm just saying here is that what does it mean is that if you look from the X2 and you think of this X2 as like shifting from left to right, this X2 allows more and more blue points in the picture, in this area of interest. Okay. And the observation is that there is some one segment of the positions of X2 where the, num the set of blue points is correct. It gives the correct alternation. If we allow more blue points inside the picture, the alternation starts to be too many. Yeah, there's, there are too many changes if you go from top to bottom between blue and red. If, there, if the line is too early, too much to the left, then there are too few blue points and the alternation is too small. Yeah, the X2 should be placed such such that if you scan from top to right, you change blue into red six times or five times because you have got this from your part and you know that there are five divisor lines. There are actually five lines that change the color from red to blue, etc. So for fixed value of X1, you have got a segment of the values of X2, which are allowed from your pattern. Okay, and this segment is like consecutive and the object is like, the, and if it's, the more to the left, there are too few blue, blue points. And if it's too more, too more to the right, there are too many blue points for your pattern, okay? So now, 
That's the first observation. But the other observation is that on this picture, let me go further just to, uh, yeah, so that's what we said just before. And what we said here is that, hey, even with this X2, it can be placed between this position and this position up here. Okay, if we know that it can be placed between this position and this position, we don't know exactly which blue point will be there. We don't know if this point will be included or not. It doesn't matter for the pattern, but it matters. Mm, but it matters. Remember that X1 is fixed. But what matters here is that regardless of where X2 is placed, we know that these guys will be in the first red block, these guys will be in the second red block, and these guys will be in the third red block. Yeah, because all these divisor blue guys already appeared if there's X2. Yeah. If we go with X2 further from left to right inside this region where it's allowed to put there, it only makes more blue lines, but it doesn't make an extra alternation. The alternation is the same. So the partition of the red guys is exactly the same. The partition of the red guys into blocks is exactly the same. There will be like more or less blue guys in between, but the partition into blocks is exactly the same. So now what I want to say here is that knowing the value of X1, you can phrase this statement of saying, hey, actually, you can phrase the, you can phrase the constraint, hey, Y7 is above this block, and Y5 is below this block, and Y4 is above this block, and Y3 is below this block, and Y2 is above this block. You can actually phrase this, this, uh, this constraint without looking onto X2, yeah? So if X1 is here, and X2 is such the pattern is correct, so it, X2 is between these two positions, then the const, then you actually already know where, how the blue red lines are partitioned into blocks, and you can actually, mm, and you can actually like make the constraint, actually Y4 is in the correct position respecting the red, red points. It correctly divides the red points into blocks. Okay, you don't know about the blue points, so you need to make this analysis turn around this whole picture and make the same analysis for X2 and the blue points up there. But from the point of view of the red points, you can just bind X1 and Y7 to say, hey, Y7 is above this block. And you actually can bind X1 and Y5 to say Y5 is below this block. Okay, so that Y5 is in the correct position to track us to this block. So what I made just here, what I made just here, uh, what I made just here is that let's let's go over the next picture. Oh, this is the picture. Yeah, what, what I made in this picture is that instead of saying the constraint, hey, actually this this cell actually doesn't contain like this. Oh, maybe this is not the correct. Well, this is the correct cell here. Sorry, this is the correct cell. So actually, instead of saying the constraint, this cell is empty, which binds x1, y5, and y y4 or saying this cell is empty, which actually binds y, X2, Y5, and Y6, or Y7, if you can try to say the larger one, Y5 is empty. Instead of binding three variables, I want to have a binary constraint here. And I want to say that is enough to have constraints X1, bind X1 with one, two, with a constraint saying that these guys make the correct alternation, yeah? That if for every value of X1, we only allow the values of X2 that make the correct alternation here, that make the correct alternation going, blue-red alternation going from top to bottom. And also, for every value of X1, we allow only the values of these boundary guys, okay, that are correct with respect to the corresponding blocks. And now X1 cares about the boundary of the red blocks, and X2 will care about the boundary of the blue blocks. Okay, I tried to be quite not super specific about the peak, uh, but to give you the insight that by this trick, by this trick, you can actually you can actually get rid of this ternary constraint by understanding this picture. You can actually at least on this picture, like this is quite a specific picture, you can actually get rid of this ternary constraint and replace it with a binary constraint, binding x1 with x2 constraint saying the pattern is correct, the alternation is correct, and the Constraint is x1, x, and y, 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 i, y, j, y, i, being the being uh, that actually the the red block is correctly respected by the border lines, and not, not caring about the blue points at the moment. The blue points will be handled by x2. Okay, and the point is that you can prove that the picture I draw you here is the worst case picture. That if the pictures are a bit different, like the red points are around here or something like that, actually the 
picture is much simpler up there. But this picture with the red and red on one side and blue on the other side is actually the most complicated picture, and all other ones are simpler. So you can actually reduce the case three constraints to this binary constraints, which is a good sign already. Oh, sorry, uh, uh, this is actually a good sign, but. Uh, the, the binary constraints, but how complicated these binary constraints are. Yeah, if you think about the CSP problem with a guys having k guys having large domain, I mean, if the constraints are arbitrary binary constraints, you can encode click easily. Like the multicolored click is exactly this problem with arbitrary constraints. So let's understand further these constraints. And so let's understand the constraints x1 and x2 are the correct alternation. And I already argued you that this constraint is very nice. This constraint looks like that. If this is the value of x1 and this is the value of x2, then the allowed, these are allowed values, allowed pairs of values, allowed pairs of values is like that. Yeah? Because you what you say is that for fixed value of x1, there's like a segment of values of x2 that's allowed. And the analysis in the other direction for fixed values of x2, there's a segment of x1. And there's this notion like if you allow more blue points, more blue points in your area of interest, you need to allow less red points to be alternation to be the same yeah because it's like either there are too many red blue points and the alternation is too much or there are too few and the alternation is too little so this like this allowed segments they are moved together along along up there yeah so this picture of like this matrix or this picture of allowed values look like that and you can phrase it as a an end and conjunction of a large number of constraints you already know and love, maybe these binary constraints that make a polynomial times of all the CSPs, yeah? Because you can kill all these corners by adding a different constraint, by adding a different constraint of the form, something smaller than something or something that's larger than something, okay? So what I want to say is that the constraint, the pattern is guessed, is as guessed, this alternation is correct. This is a, is a simple constraint. This is a constraint from this polynomial time language. We are very happy they're easy to phrase. The difficult case, becomes now, and difficult case becomes now with the yj is between the correct value of points. And here I prepared a sort of an animation to show you that it's difficult, yeah? So look at this, this is x1 and look at the middle guy, yeah? This is the picture with the alternation like blue, red, blue, red. So this is like the simplest complication alternation and look what's happening. If this, if I go like that, uh, I would go slower, sorry. I clicked too quickly and my tablet didn't manage. Yeah. If I go like that, I go, go, I progress with x1, but the line, the second line goes up, then it goes down, then it goes up, then it goes down, then it goes up, then it goes down, and then it goes up. Yeah. So the fixed value of x1 really determines the position of this y2, really determines the position of y2, but this correct, this correspondence is not that easy yeah it's like going and then going up going and then going up let's like zigzagging a bit it really looks like that uh, let me go it really looks like that that's like the picture the, the, the graph what's the allowed position of y2 append x1 maybe it should be swapped but whatever and uh, yeah so this is the picture of allowed things and this is the thing that you cannot phrase as this as this like current corner cutting thing you cannot phrase as a conjunction of this x1 is smaller than blah blah or X Y two is smaller, larger than blah blah. You cannot phrase it as this type of con uh, conjunction of this type of constraints, May mainly because you cannot like kill this area here, up there with this type of constraints. You cannot say that this area is not positive like that. So what do we do with these pictures? Well, you, now this is the moment when you start to be when you start to be mm, thinking, okay, maybe the problem is actually double and hard. You reach the hard picture, yeah. So when you work on some STD problems, you actually reach the moment when you, hey, we're actually trying to, um, you are trying to like prove lower bound, prove positive, prove lower bound, and like getting ideas from the other. So maybe let's try to make a lower bound out of this type of pictures. And we tried for a while, and we thought these constraints are really not that expressible, uh, are not really that, these constraints are not really powerful. We couldn't encode multicolored click inside these constraints. They're not that powerful, like this type of constraints. So what can we do here? So the main idea here was to actually now stop working on the red blue points. Okay, we understood from the red blue points that this, the red blue points have got this type of behavior when sort of like this type of matrix, this type of constraint matrix look like more or less on this picture. And uh, maybe we should now go back to the CSP language and 
enrich our language that we think is tractable with, with this polynomial that's solvable to something that's maybe FPT, not polynomial that's solvable, but FPT, parameterized by number of variables, that can actually capture the constraints looking like that, and it's still FPT, because we think these constraints are not enough to encode with bounded number of variables, bounded parameter number of variables, these constraints are not enough to make a W1 hard language, okay? And then once we enrich our CSP language, we go back to red blue points and try to prove that actually this is the worst thing that can happen and you can encode this as our new CSP. And this is exactly what happened. So I have got five minutes left. So I want to actually define you the CSP we defined and don't to give you the proof. I have got here already on the slides the proof, uh, the proof that is FPT because it's not a very difficult proof, but I won't have time for that. So I want to define you the CSP I have and then uh, conclude. So I want to define a constraint, which is, a, uh, I want to find, say that if I have a permutation, if I have got a domain like being numbers from one to N, then a permutation, I will call a permutation a segment reversion if its matrix look like this. this. What does it really mean? It really takes this line from one to N and takes some disjoint segments and reverses this. Yeah? This is like this matrix here. It takes this segment at reverse, this keeps intact, this segment is reverse and this segment is reverse. Yeah? It's really like taking disjoint segments and reversing it. This is like a very restricted set of permutations. Okay, this is like the permutation we have got. Yep, and the second type of relations I want to have in my CSP are Domino's close relations. These are really like the relations that we have, like X1 is smaller than, these are like the conjunction, the, the conjunction of, uh, uh, this is really like a big end of this type of constraints, yeah? Uh, this, the, such a relations, yeah? So I can, between two variables, I mean the relation that says, okay, that's whose matrix look like that. So if some value is allowed, then all the smaller values are also allowed. Okay, so that's like the downwards cross relation. And these are the type of constraints I want to allow. So I want to domains to be like integers, like some ordered sets really, finite ordered sets. And I want to allow this type of relations, maybe sli something slightly more complicated. Let me be a bit more organized here. Lay like in, my, in my CSP, I've got a forest where the vertices are the variables, the vertices are the variables, and uh, in one tree, in one tree, the vertices share the domain. So every tree has got the same domain. The domains are different between the trees, but inside one tree, the domain is the same. And uh, every edge on a tree is a, is a constraint, which is a segment reversion. So segment reversion is a permutation, yeah? So if you fix a value of this variable, it propagates to the entire tree by the segment reversions, yeah? So you can really think of one tree as being like one super variable, but this variable has got a few, a few different expressions depending on like the segment reversion, how it reverses the domain, okay? So this is the there. And then you, on top of that, you add some downwards close relations, okay? The, on top of that, you add some downwards close relations, and this is the CSP I want to ask. So I want to ask there are K variables here. The constraints are like, the domains are large, but the constraints are like the segment reversions and this downwards cross relations. I want to check satisfiability in FPT time in terms of the number of variables. Yeah, that's my like, uh, that's my question. And the result I'm going to skip here. So first there's a reduction that actually this is slightly more general, this more general than uh, the CSP we had before with this type of values, but that's simple. I will skip it. Sorry for that. I didn't underestimate it. This, so this is like an easy encoding here. I will skip it. And what we said here is that actually this uh, this algorithm has got this problem has got a branching algorithm with running time, roughly p to the p, where p, p is the number of variables. So if I have got p variables here. I can solve it in time p to the p by some branching strategy, which is not super complicated, but it's also not very trivial. If I had 10 minutes more, I would explain it to you, but I don't have, so I'll jump over it. So let me jump. Uh, so this is the proof. It's really, it's really like, as you see, it's layer one and a half slides, uh, but let me skip it for the matter of time. So I solved this auxiliary CSP, and now what we did, so we reached this point, and that was really a breakthrough point in our project, yeah? So we the regular point was the moment when you actually had the definition of the auxiliary CSP. Because once you have this definition, I believe, okay, it's not trivial, but I believe it's a matter of like some thinking to actually understand how to make an FPT algorithm there. But those were like a 
correct milestone, the correct definition here. That actually, on one hand, there was an FPT algorithm that solves this for us CSP. On the other hand, we could do a lot of more understanding of the red blue points problem to actually encode the red blue points problem as the forest CSP using k square variables. So there are more variables, there are really more variables than the, there are k trees, like there's a tree for every line, but the trees are of size order of k in our encoding. Yeah, and that combined together, that gives our algorithm because we have, we can do some color coding and branching steps and code as an auxiliary forest CSP and then solve using algorithm. Okay, that, that's what is the problem. And now I want to conclude mm, with a statement saying that this was really a break for a moment when we define, I mean, in my head at least, when we defined the auxiliary forest CSP problem, because it seems that we needed this power. Like we couldn't do the, our, we were stuck at red blue points and expressing it as a CSP, as a more general CSP allows us to give some intuition, some, mm, power of like how this branching algorithm for the forest CSP works there. Uh, it's like, it really departs from the red blue points things. It merges some variable, it contracts some edges, it does some simplification up there that are super cumbersome to translate back to the, to the red blue points picture. So I tried to look at this algorithm and translate back to see if I can make the entire algorithm in the red blue points language. And that was impossible because in this CSP language, we could do some things like identifying two variables, contracting some edges, do some simplifications that blow up my mind in the red blue points fashion. So this was really like crucial point of view to actually abstract the CSP, but the sweet point was to make the CSP more general than the CSP we started from with this polynomial time solvable with only these binary constraints smaller than A or larger than B. And then um, like, and then once we solve this one and define and solve, go back to red blue points and phrase it as a more general CSP. So that was like the, the, the cornerstone moment in my head. So to wrap up, these are our results. And I want to finish the talk with making some probably embarrassing statement on CSPs because when I was working on this actually for SPs, I was trying to look into literature, what's known about CSPs that have got large domain and small number of variables about the parenterized complexity. And despite the fact that our multicolored clique, our typical, our most common W1 hard problem, our most common W1 hard problem is really a CSP from this world. Yeah, it's really like you have got K variables. There are like the vertices you choose in the multicolored clique and there are N values for each, like which vertex you choose. And the edges between two sets is really a, just an arbitrary binary constraint. So our hardness really says, our basic hardness problem says that CS binary, CSP with binary constraints, K variables and arbitrary domains is W1 hard and now I want, would like to understand which type of like, uh, is there a reasonable theory explaining which type of constraints give you fixed parameter tractable algorithms here and which type makes, makes you already W1 hard. Yes, yeah, so if you look at the art of making W1 hardness reductions, you have got this art of making like edge choice gadgets and this type of things. This is, you can again phrase it as a way of thinking of Kaui. the constraints that are like arbitrary permutation constraints and projection constraints is still W1 hard. This is exactly the same as saying, like use edge choice, edge choice gadgets in, the, in this language. So can you say something more here? Can you make a reasonable theory here? I don't know. We had just one point when we really needed a new fixed parameter tractable result. We got it, but it's like one point in the C. So thanks and sorry for making it slightly longer than expected. Thank you very much, Martin. We have time for questions. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, do you know anything about kernelization for this problem? Uh, for example, could it be that this forest CSP has the polynomial kernel parameterized by the number of variables? Mm -hmm. I don't see at the moment, but the FPT algorithm is not, it's not super complicated, so it may actually have. Yeah, because now this reduction is somehow like a bit more complicated, yeah, because you want to shrink the domains, yeah, that's the only thing that's large in the instance. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, but it may be a good direction because like the FPT algorithm is like a few pages, it's not a super complicated one. Okay. And is there any reason why the um, red-blue problem itself cannot have a polynomial problem? 
I am not aware of any that reason, but maybe the IPEC guys, Eduard or Robert, have got any different opinion. I don't remember if there was any discussion on that in that paper. I haven't looked into that, and I don't see a good reason in either of the directions at the moment. Okay. Uh, will the problem become harder if we add uh, another colors? Another colors? Mm. I don't know. I okay. So I admit I was. I admit I was solving this particular puzzle. That was my mindset, but uh, I haven't looked recently into the previous papers. If there's any like things about more colors, so I don't know really. I mean, maybe maybe the answer is in the previous papers, and I I don't remember it at the moment. Okay. Thank you. Okay, well, I actually uh, got an email from Manuel Sorge and he suggested uh, the following thing. He said, it's a little bit weird that when we th say thank you for the speaker, that uh, people cannot uh, clap hands. So I, uh, maybe we can make, can make an experiment. So, and what would happen if all of us start <laughs> clapping? <laughs> But I have to unmute everyone. No, I cannot unmute, uh, right? So people have to unmute the, themselves. Yes, yes. Yes, and then just a clap. Uh, uh. Oh, no, it, it works actually. It's, yeah. Thanks, Mother. That was a nice experiment. And thanks again, Marcin. Uh, uh, thanks Thank a you. lot. And I wish to everyone uh, a very good summer and a nice solo typing. And see you in August. Thank you very much. Yeah, bye. Thank you.